Hello everyone and welcome to everything about Kurdistan. Today we're gonna take part of episode 4 in the podcast Nose of the Mountains which will be about the coronavirus in Rosh Halad, Iranian occupied Kurdistan. To take part of all the other podcasts made by Notes of the Mountains, check out the links in the description box below where you can take part of episode 1, 2 and 3 where they discuss about other different matters in or around the Kurdish question. Now, before we start, don't forget to like this video, comment your opinion down below about the coronavirus and subscribe to the channel, make sure you hit the notification button so that you don't miss any further videos on this channel. Also, don't forget to follow us on Instagram where you can take part of amazing pictures, news about this channel and where you can become one of us in order to vote directly and decide which way this channel is going to go every Sunday. Now, without further ado, let's get into the video. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Notes from the Mountains. I'm once again joined by Benyamin. Hello, everybody. We're back here again, and we want to talk about some important things that are going on in Eastern Kurdistan or Rushlat. I'm glad to be here again. It's definitely great to have you back. Um, so our the focus of our discussion today is on um, on the coronavirus situation in um, in Iran. It's getting pretty out of hand, um, and I we we thought it would be a good idea just to start um, giving some information about coronavirus. So what is coronavirus? So coronavirus is actually just a family of viruses uh, viruses, and this um, coronavirus that everybody is talking about is actually a specific type of coronavirus that is actually called SARS-CoV-2, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, but everybody is just calling it coronavirus and the disease that it causes is called Coronavirus Disease 2019 and that is just shortened to COVID-19. So it's a, res- it's a respiratory virus that is believed to have originated in bats. And we think that the first few cases originated in Wuhan, China. But since January 2020, it's spread all over the world. Um, and so I guess, um, what's the big deal with this virus? So it's, it's a big concern for three main reasons. So the first reason is that it's affecting lots of people. The second reason it's that it's killing a lot of people and it's perhaps the worst of its kind since the Spanish flu of 1918. So as of today, which is March 14th, 2020, there are over 150,000 total confirmed cases. So it's definitely affecting lots of people, but it's also killing a lot of people as well. Um, So far, there are 5,614 confirmed deaths from this virus. Um, but let's keep in mind that there are that these are just confirmed cases. So um, estimates suggest that about 80% of people with the virus will just get mild symptoms. So those people might not even get themselves tested for the for the condition. Um, and these 150,000 cases are just the confirmed cases. So people who have tested positive for the disease. But 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 because there are but because these are only the confirmed cases of the virus there are m- there are more people who carry the virus and therefore we are definitely underestimating the amount of people who are carrying the virus therefore it's believed that the actual mortality rate is somewhere near 1% rather than 3.5% mortality rate but if you compare this previous epidemic such as to the SARS epidemic of 2003 which also caused which was also caused by coronavirus as well And over about an eight month period, that infected about 8,000 people and killed about 800 people. So it had a 10% mortality rate. Then in 2012, there was another coronavirus epidemic caused by MERS. So that's Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And that infected about 2,500 people and actually killed 861. So that is a 35% mortality rate. So comparing these two previous epidemics to the epidemic we are facing now, uh, facing right now, which is COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 has already infected 150,000 people. And once again, these are only the confirmed cases. So it is much more, it's definitely much more contagious. Uh, for example, we have hit 100,000 people with COVID-19 in 53 days, where it took SARS about eight months to infect 800 people. And it took MERS a whole year to infect the first 200 people. 
So it is clearly spreading much faster than other, uh, other epidemics we have seen, but thankfully the mortality rate is much lower, only about 3.5%. But then again, uh, we believe we're severely underestimating that. So, so we believe that the virus travels in heavy droplets, so you can't get it from just breathing the same air as somebody that is infected. But if they were to cough on a surface and those droplets are on, are on a surface and you touch that surface with your hand, the virus particle will get transferred to your hand. And then when you scratch your nose or make contact with your mouth, the virus gets transferred to your face and can eventually get into the lungs um, and infect you. So in terms of symptoms, um, it is very similar to other respiratory viruses, such as the flu and the common cold. Some, some common symptoms are fever, cough, shortness of breath, and you might experience some muscle aches and pains. And your chances of dying increase significantly as you get older. So people who are over 80 years old are really vulnerable. And we also know that if you have heart disease, respiratory disease, diabetes, or immunodeficiency, then your chances of dying from the virus are much higher than someone who's young and fit, uh, young, fit, and healthy. But also one really important point that I really want to stress is that the quality of the healthcare system of the country you're living in is also a factor that plays into whether you survive or die because more developed countries are more equipped to deal with an ill patient than under underdeveloped countries and your chances of sur surviving are certainly higher in more developed countries and so that uh, i guess segues into Roche Halat, the the main focus of our discussion today um, because we know for sure that Rosh Halat is not uh, equipped to deal with this virus. Um, and that's where Benjamin comes in. So Benjamin, can you explain what's happening in Eastern Kurdistan and Iran um, regarding the coronavirus situation? Well, it's really hard to tell because uh, there is almost no media cover there and uh, like reporting the the cases and the situations is really hard you know the regime uh puts so much restrictions on um, journalists i don't know and the people who work with the media so uh, it's really hard to tell but according to the things that i've been uh, asking from people from locals and uh my relatives also uh, it's a very 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 how can I say, let's say dangerous situation there uh, because people are really scared. Um, it's mostly because of the, the very bad uh, economical situations there and also lack of medical equipments and uh, the, the bad situations of hospital, hospitals and medical uh, centers. It's very hard, you know, uh, it's really hard to explain. So as of today, March 14th, 2020, there are 12,729 uh, 12, confirmed cases in Iran, and of that, there are 611 people who have died from this. So I guess we can, we'll, we should just begin with when and how this virus reached Iran and eastern Kurdistan. How did we get here? This is a very big question, and it's uh, it's what a lot of journalists and the people who have followed this case uh, or saying that uh, the first case uh, was diagnosed in city of Qum, which is in central Iran. And it's the center of mullahs where all the schools and center of uh, the religious centers are located. It is said that uh, the person who was first diagnosed was a businessman who was coming back from China with, with a flight of Mahan Air, which belongs to the government. And after that, it is said that the same planes were used uh, for domestic flights inside Iran to Shiraz, Mashhad, uh, I don't know, other cities. And that's how people were uh, infected and it was spread uh, that way. OK, so you you mentioned that the, the first flight came in through Mahan Air, which belongs to the government. So do you believe that the government was being negligent about this and not really um, caring about the, you know, the spread of the virus and do and, well, doing, and, you know, and putting in measures to protect the people? Well, generally, this regime doesn't care about people. They don't really care if people die. And here, a lot of experts are saying that uh, 
the regime is using this coronavirus as a weapon or as a means to oppress people and prevent them from another uprising. Well, this is an idea, and I think that it's kind of true because, uh, you know, uh, the first case was diagnosed in, in the very religious city of Qom, which all the schools and like uh, religious centers are located. And after that, some mullahs from the same city were infected and they somehow ran away and went to other cities like uh, Caspian uh, cities, as we say, or Kurdish, or I don't know, other cities. And that's how they infected thousands of other people. And uh, the speed of spreading this virus inside Iran and Eastern Kurdistan is just so scary. It's out of control and the regime is not doing anything. Uh, that's how I'm saying that this was used as a weapon or means to oppress people more than before because people are, st are are just staying at homes. They're not coming out. They're scared. And it's just really horrible as I'm talking to the people inside Kurdistan, in Eastern Kurdistan, I mean. So if I understand correctly, um, you're saying that originally these mullahs, um, and a mullah is, for those who don't know, is just like a religious clergyman. Um, and essentially these mullahs so they've been affected with the virus and now they're purposely going to other places, other cities in Iran to purposely infect the people. Yes, exactly. That's what I mean. You know, in recent weeks, uh, a lot of uh, Shia mullahs have been seen in Kurdish cities. And as you know, that Kurds in Eastern Kurdistan are majority Sunni Muslims. And it's so weird to see a Shia mullah in a Kurdish uh, Sunni uh, city. And as you know, I posted a lot of pictures and videos uh, from city of Meriwan, Urmia, uh, and uh, Mahabad that a lot of Shia mullahs have been seen by the people. Uh, and as I said, this is another way that the, the regime is spreading this virus on purpose. So it's using this, this virus as a new way to oppress the people so that these people, so that the, the people will not revolt against the government. Yes, this is another uh, form of idea oppression. that a lot of yeah, and this is another idea that a lot of experts are suggesting, and I think that it's somehow really true because the people don't go out, everybody's at home, and the people are really scared, and the situations are very hard there. Okay, and how how is the situation? Uh, how's the situation of the hospitals and medical centers in Eastern Kurdistan, in Rojhelat? It's it's horrible. It's more than horrible, honestly. You know, I lived there for almost 17 years. And I, I lived in a city of about 1 million point uh, 200,000 people. And the biggest hospital only has like uh, 600 beds or something. And it's a very old and dirty and like very, I don't know, useless hospital. And it's just scary. I talked to two nurses in Eastern Kurdistan in Urmia. Uh, I talked to them and, uh, you know, I know some people there. And they told me that they don't have masks. They don't have any gloves. They don't have anything. They don't have any protection uh, clothing. And they have to get them uh, outside from pharmacies and they have to pay for it. Uh, and the regime is not giving anything to them, even the the the, the the help that they got from I don't know international uh, uh, organizations like WHO United Nations and like Europe the regime is not giving these uh, stuff to the nurses and doctors in hospitals to help the the, the infected people and uh, you know one of them told me that uh, uh, he has spent like three millions two months. Uh, for buying masks and stuff, which is about, I guess, $300 or something. Um, you know, it's just the people who are protecting themselves. The regime is not doing much. And also, uh, the person that I talked to, um, uh, he told me that uh, the hospital that he's working in is full and all the patients all are the ones that who are infected and they don't have enough medicine, they don't have enough protection 
um, uh, equipments and it's just really scary. Wow, the, the nurses don't even have, like, they have to buy their own gloves and masks and everything like that? Yes, unfortunately. You know, I talked to two of them and both of them told me that they have to buy everything themselves. And, you know, they are putting their, their lives and also their families in danger. Uh, and, you know, they are the true warriors right now. I can call them Peshmerga because they are putting their life in danger to protect people for sure for sure um and so i mean looking at like if i'm looking at the the john hopkins um website that shows you know the confirmed cases and all these deaths so it states about 600 and 611 people have died in iran from this do you believe that these numbers um are you know severely underestimated here i am checking the map uh provided by WHO, which shows that the death rates are about uh, 514 and uh, 11,364 are confirmed infected. But these are the numbers that have been announced by the regime regime's officials, which are absolutely not right. Uh, because uh, a lot of um, uh, independent journalists and uh, news bases are reporting that the death rates are about 5,000. And, uh, you know, I guess it was yesterday that Washington Post um, revealed a map that was showing that the regime is preparing a very big graveyard in uh, near Qom, the center of coronavirus right now. And uh, I guess... I'm not sure, but I guess there there were about two two thousand graves that are being prepared, um, and the regime, of course, lies about the true numbers. And even yesterday, uh, the speaker's man of uh, Minister of Health was saying that he was li literally saying that you don't have to believe in the numbers that we are announcing every day here. So they they just admitted that they are lying. If they're not saying the true numbers, uh, it's all because of politics. They don't want to uh, uh, tell the truth because, because the truth will make people hate them more than before. This is just a fact. And he, he just literally admitted that the, the regime is lying about the numbers. So you're saying that they're covering up the death rate simply to, I guess mitigate the the amount of hate that the people um that you know to mitigate their anger and their frustration yes exactly and you know uh, if you go and check their media you'll see that you'll see a lot of fake videos that they're making like they're showing the people that they're uh, disinfecting the streets and buildings and stuff like that but if you ask the locals who are living there especially in eastern Kurdistan, you'll see that the regime is doing nothing. There is no disinfection. It's all that the people are doing. You know, uh, yesterday I reported about Juan Ru, about P Piran Shar, and uh, I guess it was uh, Shno. The, the people, the locals, they, they prepare some uh, disinfection liquids. I don't know how they do it, but they were trying to clean the, the streets and like uh, the public places. The regime is doing nothing. And also in other cities like Joanro, Pawa, uh, Shno, Piranshar, Meriwan, Mahabad, and all, all like these Kurdish cities, the people, the people are um, trying to close all the gates to their cities because they know that the regime is sending some infected ambulances and uh, medical in equipments to their cities so more people will get infected. Uh, yesterday... Uh, the people of Juanru, I guess it's the city that you come from, right? Uh, they, they yeah, that's my city. The... Yeah. <laughs> Harbiji, Harbiji. <laughs> yeah, Harbiji. They, they are amazing people, honestly. I was so proud of them. Uh, they, they closed uh, the gates to their city and they, were, they, they didn't allow an ambulance belonging to the IRGC to enter their city because they know that the, the, these ambulances and cars and all the equipments that, they, they, that comes to their uh, cities are infected uh, and you know I also mentioned something that uh, something like what happened in Rojava is happening in Rojava right now because the regime is not helping 
they're not doing anything. So it's just the people who are trying to manage this. You know, it's so weak, but it's better than nothing. Like they're uh, uh, closing the gates to their cities. They're not coming out. They're, I don't know, cleaning their cities. They're disinfecting all the buildings and uh, public places as much as possible. You know, it reminds me of the time when ISIS attacked Rojava and people started defending themselves. You know, it's I it's similar to that situation. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, I, I definitely I that's how I definitely feel like there's a there's a sense of like Kurdish connectedness and um, the people coming together. But I wanted to um, go back to the ambulance. So you said that this ambulance was from these ambulances that are being sent to these Kurdish cities are from the IRGC, which is the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Um, and so, I mean, the people definitely have um, have a reason to be, you know, hesitant about um, ambulances belonging to the IRGC because, you know, just a couple of months ago, back in, you know, November, the, the IRGC was killing people during the protests, you know, killing the protesters. So, that, yeah, definitely people have a have a like a, a right to be skeptical for sure yes people of course are right and worried because... uh, and worried too yes uh, they are absolutely right the Kurds never ever trusted the central government and IRGC from the beginning of the revolution and as you know that this regime has used any kinds of weapons from chemicals to biological to kill more Kurds um, as you remember that um, in November uh, 1980, uh, when Khomeini, the leader of Iran, uh, issued a fatwa or a religious order to kill jihad, the Kurdish right? people. Yeah, jihad. And they killed about uh, 25 to 30,000 Kurds. They destroyed, destroyed thousands of villages, including my grandpa's village. Um, that's how they're doing it and they, they find anything they, they use I mean they use any weapon to kill Kurds from cool bars I don't know a lack of education a lack of medical uh, facilities and they find anything they, they use I mean they use any weapon to kill Kurds from cool bars I don't know a lack of education a lack of medical uh, facilities and everything, you know. So I'm curious to know what uh, what what cities in Rojhalat, um in particular are most in fact most affected by this. Well, uh, according to the reports from locals and also human rights uh, organizations like. Uh, Kurdistan Human Rights Network and Hengav Organization, uh, the the province of Sana or Sanandaj are the most is the most infected, and also the city of Saqiz, which is located in this province. And after that, Kermanshan, and later uh, Ilam, and then Urmia. And uh, I guess from till now, uh, about eighty two cases are confirmed dead only in Eastern Kurdistan, you know. These are uh, confirmed by those uh, human rights um, organizations that I mentioned before. But I'm sure, and also they have stated that the, the numbers are so much higher than this and they are trying to investigate more and reach more information from the locals, you know, because it's very hard. The regime is covering this up and the, they don't really allow any um, anyone to report about it and also the ones that report uh, some of them get arrested which the same thing is happening in turkey you know so there's a popular theory right now and essentially it states that a lot of the a lot of the deaths from the uh, protests back in november are actually being passed off as coronavirus deaths what do you think about this uh, theory is it true well, it's really hard to say and confirm this, but a lot of experts who are uh, monitoring the, the situations in Iran are saying that this is true and uh, the regime is actually using those uh, deaths from October's uh, uprisings, let's say, as coronavirus cases. 
Uh, also, a lot of families haven't received the corpse of their dead members yet, and they don't know what has happened to their family members, to their sons and daughters. Uh, but it can be true, I don't know, uh, because this regime is just covering the, the whole issue up. Right, and it's like the Iranian regime is such an evil regime that I I personally wouldn't be surprised, I wouldn't be shocked if this, you know, if this theory was proven that they are in fact using these deaths from the, the protests and passing it off as coronavirus uh, deaths to make themselves, you know, seem like, oh, we're not as horrible. We didn't, we only killed so many people during the protests and not, you know, how many ever it was. Well, yeah, that's, that's true, of course. This regime is an absolute devil. Uh, I guess it was Reuters that reported that over uh, 1,500 people are dead, are killed, actually, I mean, during the protests. But uh, weeks ago, another uh, document was uh, leaked that was saying that about uh, 4,800 people are actually killed in less than one week. Just imagine. And the regime is uh, not giving back the corpse of uh, the dead people to their families. Uh, and maybe this regime is using them as a um, reason to show that, that this is just coronavirus. And, you know. Yeah, certainly. I also want to bring up something very important uh, that, unfortunately, our Kurdish media and our Kurdish influencers and journalists on social media are... Uh, ignoring it, and it's the fact that uh, Rochelot and Eastern Kurdistan is somehow being forgotten by our people, especially in diaspora, because uh, the whole media, the whole Kurdish media is only about the war in Syria, I don't know, in Iraq, and the things that Turkey is doing, while all the things that are happening, all these horrible stuff that are happening in Rochelot are being ignored. Uh, well, I don't blame them a lot, but... Mm, it's only it's mostly because uh, the regime doesn't let anyone to report the things that are happening in Rochlot and uh, our journalists and uh, media people, let's say, are not free and they are being watched all the time and they cannot report, uh, which is very sad, I think. And I, I believe that our Kurdish influencers and uh, journalists, celebrities and everyone who has a voice uh, should uh, stand for Eastern Kurdistan because our people there are dealing with coronavirus right now and also they are dealing with a very hard uh, economical situation uh, beside the, all that operation from the Persian regime. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the the Kurds of Rojhalat endure so much oppression on so many fronts. Like, they're... There's so much going on, like the economic crisis, like they're extremely impoverished. You know, we talk, we talk about the Kolber situation, the lack of education, the lack of good jobs. Now, like, you know, just a few months ago, Kurds were being killed because of the protests. I mean, everybody in Iran was being killed. But, you know, if we specifically focus on the Kurds, like they were just being killed recently. And now they're now they're they're being subjected to this coronavirus. And, you know, the regime is specific, like deliberately trying to infect the people because and especially the Kurds I would say because they know the Kurds are the most um I mean we have that little we have a little itch you know so to speak we we want to uh break off from this government we want to repel against this government and you, you know you compare it to other other minorities in Iran like the Baluchis and the Azadis I mean they don't they, there isn't as much resistance from these other groups as much as there is from the Kurds um, and I will and I will just say that, you know, we do this podcast and I, you and I will continue to be a, a, a voice for Rosh Halat and we will like we are we are Kurds and we belong to a people that the vicissitudes of history have scattered over five states and a bond of brotherhood binds us and we will continue to bind us to all other Kurds wherever they live. And that wasn't my quote. I should just say that was Dr. Qasim Nu's quote uh, who was brutally killed by the Persian regime. Um, may he rest in peace. Well, during all these years of, uh, let's say, social media activism, I've always tried to be a voice for our people in Rochlot because they're really forgotten. And one of the main reasons is that 
the regime is not allowing uh, free journalism and uh, Kurdish media really don't know much about what's happening there. So I, I prepared a lot of reports about human rights situations, economics, coal burrs, I don't know, all the issues that we, we have there right now. Uh, so I, and I think that it somehow helped a, a few people to understand the situations. And I hope that from now on, our people do more uh, investigations on, on the situations in Rochlot. Yeah, for sure. And we, I mean, I definitely, and I think a lot of people um, definitely appreciate the work that you do. So thank you for doing that. Thank you so much. Uh, I also want uh, to talk about something important. Uh, I want to tell our people that please do not panic. Uh, don't stress out. Uh, I'm sure that this problem is, will pass and we will go back to our normal life. Uh, please stay hygiene. Uh, I don't know, please uh, do something entertaining at your homes, listen to music, especially Kurdish music, dance, spend the time with family, read books, and just don't stress out too much because uh, if you stress out too much, you will, your body will get weaker and your immune system will have issues for sure, as scientists say, I don't know. Just it's stay true. hygiene and mood away. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think it would be really good to actually, um, you know, end on um, end on some ways that you can protect yourself against the virus. So um, make sure I think one of the like one of the most important things to do is to make sure you're consistently washing your hands um, just before you eat or touch your face or touch your eyes or your mouth. Make sure to always wash your hands um, and be really consistent with that um, and you know, if, if it does help, wear, wear a face mask and um, just make sure to not be too close to other people. Um, these things will really, really help um, your, you know, your lower your chances of being infected by somebody else. Yes. And also, if you feel you have the symptoms, just go to the nearest uh, medical center or hospital or call your doctor. You know, we should protect ourselves and other people, too. This right exactly yeah exactly um and you know even if you you know even if you aren't if you don't have any symptoms i think a lot of people forget this but even if you don't have any symptoms m you know make sure you're not um you're not you know doing things that could pass off uh you know something like pass off the virus to some to other people because some people don't display any symptoms so some people can be infected with the virus and not have any symptoms and uh, this is a real issue because then you could pass it off to somebody who you know has a weaker immune system or has a um, has a, uh, a who are who who is older and you know so we have that responsibility ourselves to stop the spread you know continue to practice good ha hand uh, hand hygiene um, and yeah that, that will for sure help yeah, that's why. Just stay hygiene, do not panic, and try to enjoy the time at home. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming and speaking to us again, Benjamin. We really appreciate um, the work that you do, so thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me back again. And I hope that we can do more podcasts and inform more people in the future.